when we do real tests of columns, or I should say, when we do tests of real columns, we find out that uh, they behave differently than this Euler buckling model, right? Which we've derived and shown, developed in other um, lessons that this elastic or Euler buckling model is, is P sub E equals pi squared EI over L squared. If we just use the basic geometric um, properties here, then we can take the I and rewrite it as the radius of duration squared times the cross-sectional area. That's convenient in a variety of ways. One, when we put the R down in the denominator, then we got length over the radius of duration, right? So that's, a, in essence, that's how skinny this thing is, right? So here's a little small six inch ruler. It is long this way and it's thin this way. We could just take L divided by the thickness and that would give us some kind of idea of its overall, um, overall skinniness, but in sort of an aspect ratio. But we find that it's, because of this development, it's the radius of duration that matters, not the out-to-out -out dimension. The out-to-out -out dimension will give us some indication of the radius of duration, but what do you do when you have a more complex cross-section than, than this rectangular one that you have here, right? And so we like to think about it in terms of the slenderness ratio, L over R, right? Then if we also take that cross-sectional area and divide it on through, then we get a stress as opposed to an, an overall force. That's convenient because we can start thinking about then this critical stress in terms of the, <clears throat> we can think about the critical stress as opposed to the critical load, get rid of the cross-sectional area uh, amount influence. It's how it's arranged that matters, right? So if we plot the critical stress versus the slenderness ratio, it's one over X, right? But it's one over X squared, which is kind of an interesting thing here going on. So it has some sort of hyperbolic kind of relationship that that's going on. Now that's our sigma E. The thing is, is that <clears throat> this will go off to infinity the shorter and stockier the member is, but there's gonna be a cap someplace, right? We can't exceed without getting, we can't exceed elastically anyways, then whatever the yield stress value is. Right? And in the last example, we started talking about that a little bit. That we had in our previous example, a member who had a Euler stress that was about twice what the approximate yield stress was. Not quite, it was a little bit less than that. But we'll never get up to that value. We'll start yielding the member first. And so there's some influential factors here that are going to mean that the real column is going to behave differently than the uh, this theory that comes from this elastic model. And that's the first one here, right? We have elastic versus plastic behavior or response. That's one of the things that's going to change things. If we have a member that is initially curved or what we say is initial out of straightness, we're going to get different kinds of response too, right? So come back to our member. If it's already curved and then we load it up, it starts bending right away, right? Because of the eccentricity that's going on there. And that means the applied stress is gonna more quickly at some portion of the cross section approach some sort of critical stress. It will buckle even faster, right? And so that's a critical thing that makes real columns. There is no such thing as an absolutely perfectly straight uh, column. It just doesn't happen. You have also um, imperfections that are going to happen. Now, you, whether you want to call a change in material proper, property an imperfection or just natural variation, you can get into it some other kind of thing, but you, you are going to get a variability in the cross section and along the length of the member what the mechanical properties are. Now note that, yes, the strength of the, the material matters, but even more significant here is the elastic modulus and how much that varies across the cross section or along the length of the member is going to uh, be important. The end conditions are going to influence things significantly. Our model so far has been that our, um, our member is pin pinned on either end, but what if we clamp it, 
right? And so if, if we clamp it like a fixed fixed end and then I squeeze it, notice that deflected shape is significantly different. That's not a half, half sine wave anymore compared to this. And mine, I don't know if the microphone can pick it up, but there's this sort of different snapping that even happens here. Very interesting, right? So the degree that we have any friction in that pin at the end is gonna slightly change things. The more we clamp down on one end compared to the, wow, look at this, right? So I pin on one end, but I clamp on the other, that changes that buckled shape a lot. And boy, get yourself a ruler like this. You can feel that big difference in the, the buckling force uh, quite a lot. And then, especially for any uh, cross section that's made, uh, where heat is around in like a steel or aluminum where you're rolling the section and then you have then differential cooling, you're going to end up with what's called residual stresses. All of these things are going to alter then what we're going to see in terms of real column behavior. Now, if we go test a whole range of length of members and you know, keep maybe the cross-sectional area the same, <clears throat> but have different slenderness going on here. What you're going to find is that out here in this really skinny, long region, that the data is going to be kind of close. You know, these are all, each dot is a different test that, that we're running. It's going to actually be pretty close to the Euler model. Maybe a little bit above because it's hard to get a perfectly uh, pinned end. Sometimes a little bit below though too because uh, we might have some initial out of straightness, but we can kind of control that. If you have a short stub and you're squeezing it, you're just going to get the basic compressive yield stress. So those values are going to be around in there. But when we get into this intermediate region, what happens is that the data points start having a lot more scatter. And the question that, that folks were trying to address uh, so to speak, for the last 100 years or so, is well, what should be the appropriate curve that we might fit in there? It's called the column curve, oftentimes. And it depends on the material and the industry, what they like to do, whether it's wood, aluminum, or stainless steel, or the steel floats, right? They all have ultimately different kinds of curves that they like to, to put in here. Concrete is also vastly different, too. Generally, what you're gonna find is some sort of S-shape here that's kind of like a ski slope that they'll tend to fit in here. And they'll, they'll throw this S shape in here and they'll try to do their best to model, fit the data, right? And they'll try to come up with an appropriate curve and then they'll put a factor of safety that will lower this down and say, okay, our strength in compression is, is different. But the, the characteristics are here that down here in this short region, that might end up being just a flat region the way they decide to model it, but that's your plastic region. You're just going to get full plastic behavior in the cross-section at the onset of, of the limiting load. Way out here somewhere, there's a transition where you'll say that that's all elastic behavior at the onset of buckling, that all of the stresses um, across the cross-section, regardless of taking account of the, any bending that's happening, is all going to be um, in this elastic region in this model that we have here would be a pretty good one. And then we get this partially plastic or inelastic region that shows up. And it's in the inelastic region that actually the residual stress effect has its biggest impact. It won't affect as much out here, not gonna affect as much out here, but it does affect what's going on and it helps to explain the larger scatter because the residual stress values are not necessarily um, certain. So let's take a common uh, uh, rolled steel shape, like a wide flange shape, right? Residual stresses are ultimately caused by differential cooling, right? The edges of these, this cross section are little radiator fins, right? And they cool a lot faster than areas like the joint between the flange and the, the web. Right? A lot more material, a lot more mass. It takes longer for that to cool. And the end result of that is that you get then a difference in the cooling rates and you also then get these locked in stresses that are going to show up. Out in the radiator fin, so edge of the flange, you get locked in compressive stresses. And in the middle, you get some tensile stresses. 
right? So in that region right here, sort of in that kind of region, you get t net tensile stresses. And that's a good thing actually for you in terms of compression. That means that you have, in effect, um, you, can, you can take on a little bit more compressive force, but out here, you can't. You have two things that are gonna hurt you. One, you already have some locked in compressive stress. So getting up to the critical stress will happen faster and you don't have very much lateral support out here for this cross section. You can end up with local buckling happening. So what they've done is they've taken these cross sections with these locked in stresses and they've gone through and done a simple uh, compressive stress test on them. And what they find when they monitor what goes on instead of having this nice elastic, perfectly plastic behavior that you get with your typical steel intention, what happens is you come up and it starts to bend over, that curve bends over. Now you end up at the same sort of maximum uh, yield stress here. So the residual stress doesn't impact that, but it does make a change in how stiff the overall cross section is. And that's what's causing this larger variability. There's some randomness here in these locked in residual stresses that does affect us here. And so we have to be very thoughtful and careful about how we establish this column curve in that particular region to reflect that um, the initial out of straightness effects are kind of important in here, but it's really the residual stresses are the big impact here. The initial out of straightness will hurt us more out here because we're so low to begin with, right? Yeah, much lower compared to the yield stress when we're out there. All right, so real column behavior is different. And what we're going to do in another lesson is look at um, the end conditions and their effects and the bracing points that we might have. That's going to show up in a, in a different way in our column model.